It's good to see people that have been visiting and traveling all over the U.S. back with us this morning. Tony, Aline, good to see you. I miss you guys. Before I get started here this morning, I wanted to, to just quickly take a few seconds to say thank you to Mike Escalante. Man, we had fun last Saturday night. Not was it was the event good, which is where this thanks starts, but have you been looking at the pictures that he's used or captured from the event, from our church services? I'm absolutely blessed by your talent, and I just want to thank you for giving of your time to capture memories, to, to capture moments. I noticed this this morning that the complex that we use for our soccer game, they actually commented on our Facebook page, liking the pictures, talking about great action shots. It's just good to know that we have talents here that we could just use to, to catch people's attention, people wanting to be a part of us. And so not just the photos, but for the opportunity, thank you. Now, next time you see something come up that we're going to be kicking a ball around, come out. You don't have to kick a ball around. You can fellowship. We can just be together. There's just something about seeing kids run and being excited and just having bonding time. We're family. It's good to bond. So I hope that next time you'll join us on that. Here I am. Send me. You know, there's, there's often a, a crisis of guilt and grace that occurs when, when we are called to serve. And this usually comes into play when nominating committee times comes around. It's everybody's favorite time, right? What, no comment? <laughs> because you know that when nominating committee time comes around, you're too afraid to open your inbox. And when a local number calls you that you recognize as someone from church, <laughs> I didn't see it. Because we, we've, we kind of, we don't know how to react when people ask us to serve. And sometimes we do know, and sometimes there's this, this feeling a little guilty, but we're not, we're not ready to serve. We're not who we're supposed to be to serve. We know that the love to God and love to man is what life is all about. We know that the kingdom of God is to be ushered in with deeds of love and kindness. Um, deeds that we do. Deeds that we perform. Uh, we know that in church we all belong to each other and that we need attention from one another. Am I right? And we spoke about the last time I was up here. Again, as I said here now, we're family. And we need to uplift and encourage and inspire each other. We are going through things that we don't understand. We, don't, we are going through things that, that is just too heavy to bear. And we need a church family that can simply walk up to you and just put their arms around you, even if they don't know what's going on. Because let's face it, if you know family... You will look at your family member, and without them saying a word, you will know. Get up. Go over and hug them. You know, Michelle, I'm putting on the spot, but she's made it very clear to me that when you look at me and you see X, Y, and Z, don't talk. Don't do anything, really. Stand up and just hug me. And many a time we see that in church and you will sit and glance around, you'll say, oh, you know, that person looks like they're going through a rough time. Well, don't just leave it there. Go and give them a hug. Or at least give them a, a high five. Um, I, uh, be careful with the brotherly kiss thing. Yeah, but, <laughs> but at least when you feel that someone in the church is going through a rough patch, whether you know what's going on or not, show love. Show kindness. Don't let it go because that person's going to go home wondering what happened. Where's my church family? We know that people suffer and have need 
of our service, our love, our kindness. We understand that Jesus said to us, as the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. We know all of these things, yet we often hesitate because at the point of service and the point of the call to service, we hesitate. The majority of the answers we get when we call people to serve is, I would like to take some time off. You know, I've been, I've been working for so long, it would be nice to just take this year off. Well, how do you think the world would go if every doctor felt that way? If nurses felt that way? And believe me, if you're a doctor, I love you. But without the nurses, <laughs> you, you would definitely not take any time off. But you know, but just general, uh, we, we can't just say when it comes to people, we want to take time off. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about life eternal. You know how many people make their decisions for life eternal by how they are treated at church? I could write a book about people that have come to church for the first time and that also happened to be their last time. We hesitate at the point of service. And I must say that my experience as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor has been that um, we bear this particular sort of guilt when it comes to things called witnessing and uh, evangelism and, and outreach. It's words that, that we use heavily, and I know that even the, the administration of the church will make pastors feel really bad by saying, well, pastor, when I look at you and I look at your evangelism, well, the pastor then turns around and says, Church, how much evangelism have you done? And we keep on laying the guilt on top of each other instead of just saying, What is it that we have been called to do? Now, how do I go about it? We know that God wants to use us. And that very point of service, at that very point, we feel ambivalent and we go through this crisis of guilt and grace. It's all good. And I think that it should be that way. We should be serious about serving Christ. We shouldn't just flippantly try to serve Jesus. We have to actually be serious about it. See, Jesus also doesn't want us to just serve without thinking. It's all good if everybody at the church today said, yes, I'm going to do an act of service. I'm going to act like a Christian. And that's all good and well. But Christ actually wants us to do more than just stand up and say, okay, sure, whatever. Let's do it. Have you ever asked someone to do something and you just know that there's something wrong when they're like, sure, yeah, okay, whatever. Let's, yeah. Like, well, dude, you're not even really in it. Don't worry about it. I've got it. No, I said I will help. Yeah, but... I want to see that you want to help me. You know, again, kind of in my household, yeah, I'll wash the dishes. I oh, know, never mind. I want to see that you want to vacuum. I want to see that you, I will never look like I want to vacuum. I will never look like I want to do the dishes. And so in that sense, I'm going to fail miserably as a husband every time. And God doesn't want us to just say, okay, whatever, give that tracks. Yeah, I'll give it a hundred tracks. That's not what it's about. God wants us to want to go and give out a hundred tracks. He wants us to want to give out a thousand tracks. He wants us to want to reach out to people. He wants us to love people. I can get up and make anybody feel loved and welcome at church, but there's a difference between me walking up and making you feel welcome and me making you welcome by actually giving you the spur that Christ has laid on my heart to you. And not just playing a role. God wants to see us transformed into being creatures of care and love. You remember the story Jesus told of the two brothers 
they were asked to go and do something. The dad came up to them and he said, hey, would you mind doing this for me? And the one brother said, yes, I will do it. And the other one turned around and said, no, I'm busy, I'm playing Xbox. Or whatever they were playing back then. But the one who said yes, ended up turning around going, man, I said yes because I don't want my dad to tear into my hide. But he's gone now, <laughs> I'm not gonna do this. The one that said no, felt guilty. You know, my dad has done so much for me. The least I can do is just, do, I, I feel bad. I shouldn't have said no. And the one that said no, gets up and goes and does what the dad originally wanted. And so it's important to, to think through the things that Christ has asked us. It's not a matter of just saying, okay, yeah, God expects us to do this, I'm gonna do it, okay, sure, whatever, check. But God wants us to actually think through, what is it that he asked me to do? Is this something that I feel compelled to do? Is this something that I want to do? And then adjust my attitude accordingly. You can see when someone loves what they're doing. I don't know how many times I would go harvest in gathering. Anybody, you guys remember harvesting gathering old school way with cans, door to door? I hate it. I hate it with a passion. And the Pathfinder as well, it's part of your curriculum, at least they made it part of our curriculum. You don't gonna move up a class until you've done at least so many hours of harvesting gathering. Hi, would you like to donate to people that are needy? Okay. Yeah, people just know. I mean, it came to the point where the director just told me, dude, just don't worry. <laughs> we'll find something else for you to do. Because it is so clear in my attitude that I'm not in it. I don't care. And even when you fake it, hello, would you like to give money to needy? Dude, what, have you, what are you on? Your face is never like that. You know, so from one extreme to the next, people will know. But when you actually care, and like, guys, I'm here to help. Oh, wow. You, know, you, you, get, you just feel the vibe. You feel the difference. You feel the change. So here's this whole business of service, which is supposed to give the intended fundamental meaning of life to life, and we're afraid of it. We're afraid of that service. And this morning I wanna walk through this, this guilt, grace complex as we talk about service. To once again be able to, to understand what it means and to actually mean it when we say, Lord, here I am, send me. As you remember, that comes from the prophet Isaiah. This is the first portion of scripture that I want us to look at, Isaiah 6 verse six. So turn there with me in, in your Bibles, in your iPads, iPhones, Kindles, or listen in your hearing. But this is where guilt, service, and grace all sort of merge together. And Isaiah starts to address this concept right here. And so in Isaiah 6, Isaiah says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Do you just get that majestic vibe? And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, 
Here am I. Send me. Now it's interesting. See, Isaiah had been a pretty good preacher up until this point. He had been a good preacher preaching against sin. It's something not a lot of pastors want to preach on these days. Because if I have to call sin by its rightful name, I don't know how many would be attending here anymore. We don't want to offend anybody. Right now, we are too afraid to say anything in public because we're going to offend somebody. And let me be quiet with you. It doesn't matter what you say these days, you are going to offend somebody. So you might as well just stand up, step up, and call sin by its rightful name. You're going to offend anybody, somebody anyway, so just do it right. It doesn't matter. Let them get upset. It's not about what people feel like. It's about where they will end up. And we have been called to stand strong. But we don't want to offend anybody. But my friends, by trying to not offend people by calling sin by its rightful name, we are offending the one who died for those sins. So Isaiah preached highly against sin. He would walk around the marketplace calling out sin the way he saw it, where it was, how it was, when it was, not holding any punches. But Isaiah went to the marketplace and he began to preach in song. I would have loved to have heard that. But he is he's singing in a minor key. And he is singing about the woes, the sins of Israel. Now today we find YouTube videos of preachers on boxes in Piccadilly Circus in England. Any of you guys ever been there to listen to some of these preachers? It's ridiculous what some of them preach. And most people will come and listen to these preachers purely to take a video so they can post it on YouTube. I've been to Piccadilly Circus and I've taken the video of my preachers preaching. But we don't really care about what they say. And when people today are standing on a platform calling out sin the way the Bible tells us to, well, they're kooks. They're fanatics. But yet we've been called to do just that. We've been called to let our light shine in the darkest of nights. But we don't want to be kooks. We don't want people to laugh at us. And here is the prophet Isaiah walking through the marketplace. He is walking through downtown Austin. He's walking through all the major malls in the Austin area, singing about the sins that are being committed all around him. Now that takes guts too. Because we know back at that time, they didn't just like... Can someone dial 911, get some guys with extra long white sleeves to come and get him, you know, wrap him up? And they would stone him, lock him up. But yet he called it because he felt called by God and he had a burden for everybody's salvation. And so he could not keep quiet because you cannot keep quiet when God has laid a burden on your heart. So he goes out and sings and he sings about the six woes from their misuse of riches to the abuse of the poor. He sings of all of this. And then all of a sudden, you know, he stood upright after singing his song with the six woes. Unlike, I think, what would happen if I had to sing my sermon. I think you would have knocked me over before the first verse was done. But somehow they still let him sing six woes, the sins that they are guilty of. But Isaiah then in chapter 6, suddenly there comes from the six that he had just sung, a seventh woe. He's saying, guys, it is not just you. I'm going to be very honest with you. Listen to me. Seventh woe. Woe is me. I know I've been singing and saying all the wrongs that you've been committing. I know you feel like I'm out here pointing fingers at you, but I'm pointing fingers at me too. Woe is me. For I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And now my eyes have seen 
the king, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. I need to be killed right on the spot. I've seen holy when I know who I am. When I know the thoughts I think, when I know the words that I've uttered, when I know the things I've done, woe is me. Sin, guilt, repentance, grace, all of these things merge together here in Isaiah. And he's, he's feeling guilty, but he's also feeling called. How do I deal with this? <sighs> woe is me. Many people, when I asked them if they would be willing to serve, especially when it comes to the office of elder, have come back to me saying, Pastor, I can't serve as an elder. I don't feel worthy. When I read through the Bible and see what elders are supposed to be, I fall short. I'm not ready to serve as an elder. Many people feel that they can't serve God because they are sinful. Well, welcome to the club. Many people feel that they can't serve because they can't get their, their act together. Welcome to the club. The Bible tells me, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But yet from within this group of sinners, God says, you can help me help them to help each other to pull themselves out of this muck they're in. We can pull together as a family. You are not going to save each other. That is why I sent my son. But you can help each other pull up, stand up, and rejoice that there is a gift of salvation waiting for them. May the Lord spare the church from zealots who come into the church. And feel that they can bring their background, their understanding, and enforce it on the church rather than bring God's love directly into the church. There are many who have never understood true repentance. There are many who have never experienced true broken heartedness that feel that they need to step up because they need to come and share the truth. God is not looking for people who come to church with a militant attitude. He is looking for those who have been broken. God is looking for those who understand their need of Him, not those who feel that they are God's mouthpiece. God is looking for people like you and me, not to do anything more but to explain by our actions who God is. There are people that come to our churches and they can out-argue anyone. Ever experienced those? It doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what Bible verse you quote, they will out-quote you, out-perform you, out-argue you, and if you don't agree with them, well, then you're from the devil. There are those that come to our church, they can out-proof text anyone. They can use the Bible to establish superiority of their church and their doctrine no matter who they are talking to. They've never known about true failure in their lives. They've never truly turned to God and said, Lord, I messed up. Lord, I blew it. Can you forgive me? And Lord, now that we're starting again at square one, how can you use me? The Lord spared the church from people who are not healed from their past. This is where we come to heal from our past. But this is not where we bring our hidden agendas with it that we haven't been healed from and try to dictate how others find healing and health. They like to point out the flaws in others, yet they've never taken the time 
to take a serious look at themselves and allow themselves to see the dirt on their faces. They bring into the church all of their baggage of the past and in serving God give expression to that very baggage that they are carrying. You know, I'm mad at my dad. I never quite understood my anger towards my dad. And I'm just going to lay it on the church and the pastor and the head elder, all the father figures in the church, they, they're going to get it from me. I don't know why, but mm, I had some experience with, with a boy at camp that I always felt guilty about. And so now I'm going to persecute anybody that looks like they're gay. You know, my mother used to beat me with a belt with studs on it. Always thinking she's the boss of everybody. And now the church wants to ordain past female pastors and female elders over my dead body. And people bring things from their past into the church today that's got no relevance biblically on who we are. But we will superimpose it to suit our needs so that we can come out superior when it is not our church but God's church. May God save us from people who can't let go of the past and embrace the future with Jesus. It's a good thing to say, Lord, I don't deserve to speak in front of your people. I still to this day don't know why I felt called to the ministry. I will be challenging God in heaven. I want to see the, the Blu-ray movies of when they decided around the boardroom table why I'm going to be called to be a pastor. Because I don't like speaking up front. I'm not a public speaker. God has a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> but you know, it is a foolish enterprise where a sinful human being, such as myself, has been called to try and explain the unexplainable to my peers. I've said this before, I don't even know, I don't have the English vocabulary to explain to someone that's never smelled coffee what coffee smells like. Think about it. Do you have adequate words to describe what coffee smells like? Or if you're a really good Adventist, Roma. <laughs> Actually, I don't even want to know what that really smells like. But coffee. You can say it smells like Starbucks, but if you've never been to a Starbucks, that doesn't... And here, God has called me, someone who can't even explain what coffee really smells like, to come and explain to you who God is. That's foolishness. How do I explain to you who God is? The very act of preaching is sinful act. Because I can never truly do God's character justice by the words that I use. And by cutting God short of his true glory, that I believe is a sin. But I try. And I sin trying. And so the angels come. As I believe they will do for each and every one of us. The angel goes and gets a burning hot coal from the altar and anoints his lips and said, Isaiah, we know you're a sinner, but now you've been anointed by God and God is going to use you with your sin to help others come to a better understanding of who he is. And God wants to anoint each and every single one of us if we are willing and able to sit back and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. It's a wonderful thing to know that, that there is more than our sinfulness. It is an incredible thing to know that there is a thing called forgiveness. I love the concept of forgiveness. Don't worry about it. As far as the east is from the west, I will take away from you everything you've done wrong. It never happened. But Lord, no, shh. Now you're anointed. To get a searing kiss from God, 
that actually hurts. There was an old commercial when I was a little kid from, um, of Aqua Valva aftershave. And I remember this commercial because it's before I started shaving. And I could never understand why, because the guy would shave and then he would take his Aqua Valva and go, and just get this hard slap in the face and it would make this sound. And they were like, Aqua Valva fresh. Why would he pull his face like that? Until the first time I shaved, and my dad bought Aqua Valva for me. <laughs> that was like a smack in the face. You know, and I think sometimes God wants us to have that smack in the face experience where it's not just, <sighs> it's a shock to the system. Wake up. I've got you. It's a new day. It's a new beginning. It's a new opportunity. Boom. Ouch, that hurts. Okay, but now I've got your attention. Let's go. Nobody unpacks this matter of the crucial role of a broken heart in the matter of serving others better than David. You remember the story of David? Good guy, right? <laughs> it depends which story we're talking about. You remember David had, had seduced another man's wife. Now today, this, like, people really don't even seem to care about it except for the wife that's been cheated on or you know, the person that's been cheated on. But he strategically planned this whole affair, got his military, the secret service, everybody involved to get this woman up to his boudoir. And then when he had seduced her, or whatever he did, he sent the husband to the very front lines. He promoted him to be a Navy SEAL and dropped him off behind enemy lines, knowing that he was probably going to be killed. And guess what? He was. And he figured he had gotten away with it because he's the king. You know, sort of like we see our leaders in the country today think they can get away with anything. Okay, that's a different sermon. But he is starting to deal with us. He's starting to deal with us, trying to cover it up, trying to move on with his life. See, because he's the one representing God to his people. He is the king, God's representative, God's leader of his people. But he's hiding all of this, and so his guilt takes a hold of him. And he starts to physically get ill with the guilt eating away at him. He feels as though his bones are broken, he's hurting. And God, seeing David in agony, takes the initiative and sends the prophet Nathan. David gets worried. He says, a knock at the door. He opens it up. There's the pastor for a visit. <laughs> Whoops. I mean the prophet, sorry. The prophet Nathan tells him the story. And at the end, when David gets upset and said, now that is the guy. That, he needs to be arrested. He needs to be killed. Nathan says, okay, that was just a story. But that story is based around a guy that I actually know. And that guy, your majesty, is you. And David breaks down. And he begins to see who he really is. He is not the royal man that he believed he was. But he was back at the sinful little boy, back in Jesse's grounds and his campus. And nobody and nothing. Because let's face it, each of us, you and I are nothing until God calls us. Oh, what am I talking about? He knew us before we were even born. He had a plan for us. Plans for us to prosper. Not plans for us to seduce people, murder them, and hide the evidence. And God, through the prophet, cuts David down to size. And when David understands who he is and how God is seeing him, he writes this poem, Psalms 51. He publishes it for everyone to sing because he knows everyone, you and me included, can resonate with this. David says, looking at verse 10 in Psalms 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Lord, please restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. David sees his sinfulness. David acknowledges and recognizes that he's a sinner and he knows that God's grace and mercy is there for him but has been withdrawn because of his very own actions. And he's saying, Lord, don't leave me. Don't let your Holy Spirit leave me. I need you. And he says, oh God, renew a right spirit within me. Lord, please heal me. Forgive me. See, when we've really blown it, we need to work through things. It's not like we, our kids do something wrong and then you call them over, come here. Now I want you to go over there and say you're sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's not what it's about. It's a matter of I want you to go and sit in your room for 20 minutes. Think about what you've done. Do you understand what you've done? Now what do you think you should do now? Say sorry. Well, come, let's go and do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, they've worked through it. They have thought about it. It's resonated. They understand it. And God doesn't want us to just go, okay, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Peace out. Okay, what now? God wants us to think about this, work through it, talk through it, wrestle through it, and come to the point as he did with Jacob. Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you've blessed me. Lord, I want you to forgive me, but not just forgive me. I want you to create a new heart in me. Make me new and shower your blessings on me. At least let me know that your Holy Spirit is still with me. I cannot do this by myself, and I know I've done wrong, but Lord, create in me a new heart. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Let's face it, when you know you are saved, you will be joyful. See, many of us can't be joyful because we're not sure. Because we know who we are. But we have to come to the point where we are broken and surrender it all to Him. And then we know by God's grace, we can claim salvation. Oh, to serve God from joy. Not just, oh, brother, yeah. Now I've got to go and do this again. Oh, brother, now I've got to go and sit on this committee meeting again. Sure, whatever. At least I'll get an extra star on my crown for showing up to every meeting. Well, that's if you even get upstairs to get your crown. See, that's not what God wants from us. He wants us to serve out of joy. God has forgiven me. He's given me another chance, and I want to do whatever I can to help each and every one of you also get another chance. Look how happy I am. I want everybody to be as happy as I am. And soon it spreads like wildfire, and everybody wants to go out and tell everybody what God has done. But that's why we've got empty seats, because not all of us are that happy. Not all of us have been broken. Not all of us have realized the sinners that we are. Because when you understand who you are, and when you understand that you've been forgiven, you will not just be involved in church things on a Sabbath. You will be involved in the things of Jesus 24-7, 365. That's why we need a revival, because we need to understand who we are. But even more important, we need to understand who He is. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. See the freedom there? Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. So have you ever felt like you can kick yourself for what you've done? Like what in the world? Oh, I wish I never did that. Have you ever felt a deep sense of regret because of Pardon my expression, I know some of the elementary kids are going to come and tell me, you said a bad word, but there's no other English word for it. I can use thoughtless, but it's not thoughtless, it's stupid. Because sometimes we just do things that are just plain dumb. 
I've had to explain to my daughter why I've got tattoos on my body that, girl, the only thing I can tell you is I was, I was silly. <laughs> because I'm trying not to use a bad word. <laughs> but it wasn't silly. It was stupid. There's no other way I can word it. I did some really crazy things in my life and I have to walk around with scars, with marks. <sighs> have you ever felt it hard to sleep because of guilt? Anxiety brought on by guilt? Then you, if you can identify with any of this, then you are the one that God wants. Have you ever felt that just that spark of, man, it is good to be saved. It is good to know that all I have to say, here I am I. That he will use me with all of my sin and my baggage and use me. Amen. Have you ever felt the joy knowing that God can use you just as you are? Knowing that it's on service training. You come as you are and he will refine you. By the time you are done, people won't recognize you. Have you ever said, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. I know we're all in the same playing field, but let's just do this together. You are the person that God is looking for. You are the person that Stonehill Seventh-day Adventist Church is looking for. God is not looking for people who simply sort of know the Bible in theory. There was a professor in South Africa who had four independent doctorates in theology and was an atheist. He was teaching pastors how to be pastors, how to be theologians, and he didn't even believe the Bible, but he studied it and he knew it as an academic pursuit, not as a matter of the heart. God does not want people who knows the Bible by academic study. He wants people who knows the Bible because they have spent time with its author. You cannot successfully convert a person with head knowledge of doctrine. You need to show Jesus to convict the heart. It is only as we ourselves have experienced suffering and at the same time experienced grace that we can truly look up on bended knee and say, here am I, sinner, but Lord, send me. Send me, Lord, because I've got something to say. I can speak to people who have blown it because I have blown it. I can speak to people who are depressed because I suffer with depression. But I have hope because I know who my Lord and Savior is. Lord, send me because I can speak to people who are anxious. As anxious as I am about speaking to anxious people. Lord, I want to help because I've been there. So Lord, here am I. Send me.